want to thank you guys all for joining. We really appreciate that. So why don't I turn it over to you guys and Todd or Gerald, you're going to kick us off. Hey, thank you, Tammy. Like you said, uh, I want to thank you for having uh, myself and giving uh, this panel the opportunity to be here today and the, and the rest of the team and all of the other presenters uh, for queuing it up and really rocking out so far today. I am irrationally excited to be here with some really, really smart people uh, and we have a lot to discuss. We're, it's going to be more of a discussion type session uh, than really any type of presentation. So with that in mind, if you have questions, post them in the Slack channel, the Modern Application Development Slack channel. I've got that open. I'm monitoring that. And we'll, or you can post them in the chat here in Zoom. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about things. We'll, we have, of course, a lot of things that we're going, we're planning on talking about. But if you do have any questions, uh, take advantage, like Tammy said, of the brilliant folks other than myself that are on this call and ask them anything that you would like. So again, this is Modern Application Development, a discussion about the path to cloud computing. And no discussion about the uh, current state of affairs would be complete without really looking towards the past. But before we get to the past, let us tell you a little bit about us. So as Tammy said, my name is Todd Sharp. I am a cloud advocate, developer advocate for cloud and cloud database here at Oracle. I've been here coming up on two years now, and I work for the illustrious Gerald Wenzel, who is my boss, and he's, I don't know if he's quite here yet, but he should be here any second now. I'm definitely Gerald, here. Gerald, my friend, how are you? <laughs> Very good, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, and Gerald's located out in San Francisco, but I am located in the beautiful city of Blairsville, Georgia. It's in the northern part of the state, about two hours from Atlanta pretty close to North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina. So I'm kind of tucked up in the corner up there. But uh, yeah, I talk to developers. I have the best job in the world. I get to play with technology. I get to make fun demos. I get to hang out and drink beer with people like Holger and Heli and just really kind of absorb all of their brilliant knowledge. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of blogging on the developer blog at Oracle as well as my own blog, recursive.codes. And I speak at conferences and I do sessions like this and talk to developers and I'm being a little repetitive. So I'm gonna kick it over to Gerald and have him tell you a little bit about him. You kind of already covered it there mostly. I suppose. <laughs> so yeah, I'm uh, based out in, in San Francisco, also part of, of Oracle and the cloud evangelism team and also uh, the data management, product management team as such. And uh, I want to really give you a little bit about my previous life than uh, my current life. You can follow me on Twitter for what I'm doing. But I uh, did start out as in the very early 2000s uh, as a developer for an ERP system. And I moved on. You were still in high school in the early 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, that's that's true as well. Yeah, it's like it was the early 2000s. <laughs> um, and yeah, so uh, it was a developer. We built an ERP system back then. Uh, was was you know still like very much um, the server client space. Uh, we've just gotten into the J2E time with app servers and so forth and VMs. And I moved rather quickly onto performance tuning because I I found that. Uh, a lot of performance challenges were not so much with like the actual technology is slow underneath, but more of like, well, we actually don't know how to use the technology. And uh, that led me to go to, to New York back then, was a performance consultant back then. And I came back to, the, to Europe, to the UK uh, for Oracle, where I joined the pre-sales field and had a lot of experience and opportunity to work with some of our biggest customers and their challenges. And yeah, now I'm over in San Francisco at headquarters in Oracle. And that's really all about me. And I would like to uh, kick it over to Heli. Thank you. So I am in a wonderful, beautiful, hot and sunny Finland, which is happened happen to be true today. It's really warm here. So that's why I'm wearing my summer clothes and I'm sweating. It's really hot. We don't have air conditioning here because this is not normal. <laughs> Are you outside or is that a virtual background? That's a virtual background. Ah, okay. I'm inside. I, I try to be inside. It's a little bit cooler. I'm not sure. It's 29 Celsius inside. So I don't know if it's not cool mm -hmm. or not. Uh, I'm a CEO for Miracle Finland, ACE director, uh, Groundbreaker ambassador, 
I have been on IT since, well, 80 something. <laughs> I usually say 90 because it sounds like I'm younger, but <laughs> 80 something being very honest. I started as a programmer, but uh, then I found databases and I learned that databases are my thing because I love data and, and using the data efficiently and, and making good decisions based on data. So that's my story briefly. Graduated from University of Helsinki with a master's degree in computer science and working on my PhD. Yeah, how's that going? Are you are you getting close? Slowly, slowly but surely. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, awesome. enjoying a lot. Very fun. We're very, uh, very glad to have you here. Um, you're someone that I've been honored to meet in person a few times at conferences, so uh, I love to have you here. So appreciate that. Thanks. And uh, what about you, Mr. Holger? Yeah, uh, well, I'm I'm okay. I'm very fine. And uh, as you may have guessed, this is also a virtual background. I'm not calling in from under the Golden Gate Bridge, <laughs> but that has is from a nice uh, sailing experience at one of the open worlds a few years back. That photograph, so that was very nice. Um, I'm, 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 I would say I'm a little older than Hedy, right? Uh, so I started in the early 80s with, with all of that, you know, assembler and some basic dialects and these kinds of things at home. And then I moved on and studied computer science in, in Karlsruhe and did all the regular, you know, Pascal, Modular, C, whatever you would program during those days. And in the 90s, I did a PhD in uh, robotics and uh, machine learning in fact, at the time. So uh, doing machine learning at the time, you would program Prolog and Lisp and all these kinds of languages. And since it was a robotics um, subject, I encountered my first Oracle databases because we would basically store, we would program robot, robot applications and we would do machine learning and we would store the data in Oracle databases in the university. And at that time, I was a programmer uh, like uh, a developer like many developers that I need today, I didn't know much about the database and I didn't care much about the database. Um, all of that changed then in the 2000s or in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s, when I focused on, 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 on databases and on data warehousing in particular and data integration, which is what I do until now. Uh, also as an Oracle ACE and as the CEO of SumIT, our consulting company, uh, here in Switzerland, where I had moved meanwhile. So now I'm still doing applications, but very data centric and uh, very database focused applications. And that gave me a different perspective on the <laughs> on that machine, really. It's funny how people, uh, well, I don't know how prevalent it is, but it seems like people really feel like machine learning is a new technology. And it's funny, you know, when they when they kind of learn that it's not at all very new. Uh, and a lot of the algorithms that we use today are 20, 30, 40 years old, you know? It's kind of funny. But uh, awesome, thank you for joining and giving us your background. So let us move on. And I'm going to, at least from my perspective, give a quick brief history of the web. So I started programming in 2004. Uh, and um, I was strictly on the web, full stack developer. But I do, of course, know a lot of the history of the web. Uh, while Heli and Holger, some of your experience predates the web, and I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about that, and we'll get to that. But as far as the web is concerned and how we got to cloud computing, let's take a quick walk through history, right? So in, as you kind of alluded to, in the late 90s and the early 2000s, what was the web? The web was static pages, right? Um, content was served from the file system. Uh, we had server-side includes and CGI scripts a little bit. We had a lot of frames, a lot of disgusting things like the blink tag, the marquee tag. Uh, animated GIFs were starting to kind of come into the scene. But for the majority of sites in that time period, things were not interactive, right? I mean, you visited a page, you loaded a page, and that was it. You got a, a, a response from the server, and you, you, know, uh, you read that, and that was about it. So... Around the time that I started to get into things, 2004, around that time frame, we started to get into web 2.0, right? Um, things were becoming more interactive. Social networks were starting to pop up a little bit. MySpace was coming on the scene. Um, things were becoming dynamic, right? You could create a user account. You could, you know, you could have a web page that displayed your name. How cool is that? It says, hello, Todd, at the top of the page. How does it know who I am? Um, 
and then we started getting into things like Ajax and XML and JSON. And the big thing I remember, I'll never forget the huge thing was, oh my goodness, no page reloads. You could reload, you know, you could reload a div without going back to the server. Well, without a page refresh, you could do that behind the scenes. Um, things like Flash were starting to come in, Java applets, Java FX, Silverlight, X forms, all these kind of crazy things that we were doing back then. And then uh, we started to kind of talk about standards and we wanted to standardize the web, right? Uh, so we started to move in towards the modern era, I think. Um, we had these things called rich internet applications. And uh, again, these were things without page reloads, uh, single page applications were starting to come onto the scene. And we started to realize that some of these were getting kind of big and kind of unmanageable and unmaintainable. So this is right around the time that the cloud started becoming more prevalent. Uh, and really the thing was we wanted to reduce complexity. We started doing things like continuous integration, continuous deployments. Uh, we didn't want to manage our own servers. We didn't want to manage our own databases. Zero downtime became huge. I mean, I remember back, you know, when I was doing deployments, if, if you did a deployment, the server was down five, 10 minutes, nobody cared. You know, it was just part, part of the cost of doing business, but not anymore. I mean, zero downtime is absolutely, nobody wants a second of downtime in their applications. We started getting into distributed services. We started getting into microservice architectures, serverless, IOT. All of these things are becoming uh, drivers for our move to the cloud. We started doing unstructured or semi-structured data, started having document databases, all of these types of things, right? So that in like five minutes is a brief history of the last 15 years of the web. Like I said though, um, a lot of your experience predates that. And that leads into my first question here, right? Um, the RDBMS has been around since the 70s. Am I correct there? Late Oracle 70s. database, late 70s, right? Yeah. So there's a gap yeah. from the late 70s until the late 90s, early 2000s, where databases existed. And then we started getting into these web-based applications. So my question to you all is, is the relational database the right place to store data for a web-based application, right? I mean, this tool existed and we kind of just adopted it because it was what we had at the time to store our data. So my question is, do you think it's the right place? Do you think if we could do it all over again, if we could go back to the late 90s and say, uh, you know, here's how we're gonna persist data or retrieve data or store data, do you think we would do it the same way? Yeah, I, I definitely think. Oh, hey, ladies yeah, first. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if I if I see the longer perspective, we got the the actually the objects came out when I was at the university late eighties. Everybody, yeah, everybody was talking about objects, and I was told it's no point studying relational database anymore because object database will yeah. replace relational database. What happened? So we have object in a relational database. Right. Other things came as well. XML came, JSON came, all different kind of things of different. Uh, technologies came, what happened with XML, XML databases replaced by relational databases, JSON, now we have huge support in, in, uh, data, in relational database for JSONs. Uh, all these kind of things happened during the years. So why would not relational database be the right place for any kind of data? I, I tend I think, to agree, yeah. Go ahead, Holger. I think basically if we, if we I mean, uh, Today, of course, uh, the, the fashion is to store everything in JSON. And then whether you put it in a database or whether you put it down somewhere else, and however you access it, that's uh, already a second question, right? But to store everything in JSON, that sort of brings us back to the 60s, before the relation of databases <laughs> existed, right? So we are going back to document hierarchies. Hierarchies, and, uh, exactly. Data, or data, data stored in, in, in hierarchies and documents like IBM and the others did it before COD came with the relation or the paper about the relation of calculus and everything. So, um, I mean, and, and, and those document databases back then were already very good for a certain purpose. But as soon as you, as, as you, I mean, you know, if you do a greenfield thing and you do your document hierarchy and everything right for your database, also in your JSON, for your application, then everything is great. But you know there is a life cycle, so you start changing things, 
and stuff. Right. And then your document structure might not might not fit anymore, right? And and or you want to, uh, for example, you you have to join data from different JSON fragments, for example, different documents, in different ways. Now things start to get really messy. And or or you have to update a document that is maybe related to multiple documents, right? Yes, yeah, and all of these things, I mean, went away, all of these problems they already had in the 60s, and they went away when we got the relational model. And uh, I mean, yes, uh, using JSON for certain purposes is great, and these kind, this, this, this kind of thing, and then also maybe a NoSQL database to serve it and whatever, but I mean, in the end, you have an application that has lots of data that you want to use flexibly, and I can't see any model that in the long term is better suited for structured data at least in the relational one. Well, it's funny how circular the industry is sometimes, and, and I've seen that in just 16 years, you know, it's like we come up with years? this, well, in the 16 years More that like I've- Three, four years. <laughs> yeah, true. But in the, in the experience that I have, it's like we have these, and I don't mean to disparage any community, certainly, but it feels like in particular, like the JavaScript industry, every five years they f discover a uh a design pattern that we knew and were using 15 years ago in the java world you know and they and they think it's this groundbreaking invention but it my point being we tend to circle back to the proven patterns the proven technologies that we knew worked we thought we'd come up with a better way uh, and, and along the way, maybe we enhanced or improved our relational database, for example, because we learned something from the NoSQL world. We learned that, yeah, sometimes you do need to store JSON. So let's create a JSON column and let's, you know, so create support for that. Um, but um, go ahead, Gerald. Go. No, go ahead. No, I, I, yeah, I fully agree, right? And I think it's, um, there's a couple of misconceptions out there in, in the IT world today. Uh, number one is, you know, the re relational model and relational database are not necessarily the same thing anymore. Um, so the relational model, as Holger and Heli just said before, came from COD for a very good reason. And what most people don't know, and I was actually a, a case of this myself, like I never learned where relational databases came out from. But, you know, what was there before was this hierarchies or this ISAM stuff, et cetera. Like I basically wasn't even around back then for the 60s and 70s. And in a nutshell, um, we, in a nutshell, those hierarchies look very similar to what uh, XML was and what JSON is now. It's a hierarchical structure where you put in, you have a kind of a master record with some attributes and then you, you uh, layer everything below. Um, and uh, Todd, you're still sharing your screen, by the way. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to find a, a, tweet, a tweet here that I just saw. Ah, that... Okay, okay. I think I know which one you mean. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I keep going while you while you try to find your <laughs> tweet. Um, so, you know, very interesting. Like, Todd actually summarized it really, really well in the very first sentence of his paper with the relational model, which was that future applications have to be protected from knowing how to structure your data inside the machine. And really what he all said was like, you know, if you structure something in a hierarchical format, then the application five, down, five years down the road or so forth will actually have to uh, understand what this hierarchical structure looks like. And so, you know, a very typical uh, example is um, you, have a, you have an employee or a customer with an address and so forth, and sometimes you just want to answer questions, okay, how many customers do you have in a given state? You don't necessarily need to retrieve all the information of the customer's first and last name and so forth. Uh, you could just go to something that just holds the addresses. And then in a nut nutshell, this is where the relational model kind of was so groundbreaking that essentially now you don't have to, you're not bound to anymore what the original application designed as hierarchies and you now have to understand those hierarchies. You see those tables, you see those relations in between, you may query some tables or not and so forth. But then, you know, to flip it around, just the, the, the relational databases as we think they still exist are gone since the mid nineties as well. And this is exactly what Hallie alluded to before or said before that, you know, it's like since like 95 or 97, something like that, when objects were hot and we came out, you know, we were basically, oh, we have object oriented programming languages. So why don't we just store those objects in the database as well? And then we don't have to deal with like going from objects to tables and back. Right. And they again forgot, yeah, this is great for your application to store your objects, but the guy who's coming along writing another application now also needs to use your objects, right? And if they don't fit the business 
uh, the business case or the model that he's after over there, then he has a lot of trouble. But there were certain use cases for objects, and this is what then got into the relational databases. And back then, actually, we started to call relational databases object relational databases. Now, the history repeated itself, as you're just saying, with the same thing in the early mid 2000s with XML. And you can now store XML in a relational database as well. Uh, and we have seen the emerge of JSON in, in the early 2010s, 2013, 14, and you now can now store JSON as well. So there's one side of like, can you use a, what you would still argue is a relational database to store other models than relational? Yes, everybody supports pretty much JSON and so forth. So you don't have to go for another technology to do so. You can do this today. You could do this years and years and years ago. And then there's the other question of like, should my data be structured relationally or should it be in JSON or should it be in a graph or should it be? And, and there is kind of always goes back to it depends, right? It's just like, should your object in your application look like A or B, right? Well, it depends on your use case, right? And there's a certain use cases where it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and there are certain use cases where it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And, and I, the one last thing to add to this is like, uh, I was always amazed that the relational databases are around since 40 years now, 40 plus years. And to some extent, that, that kind of tells you it's the most successful software that we have in IT or one of the most successful softwares, right? I mean, Linux only came in 93 and Linux is now everywhere, but so much, so much software has come and gone and relational database technologies are there for 40 years. There's not a lot of other technology that has actually remained so long and is still so critical to our everyday life. Uh, and that's just something to think about. Really. Like, oh, is relational database is all bad? We have to do it all over? Well, if it's so bad, why did we stick to it for 40 plus years? And I might, I, I, I'd like to add one more thing. Your question, when I read it right, is, is an RDBMS the right place, right? So now, Gerald, uh, uh, said very well, like, yes, the RDBMS uh, might be the right place, even if you use not relational modeling, but different uh, models in there on different engines. But I mean, the RDBMS offers all of these kinds of things like uh, transaction consistency and, 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 you know, everything that, that we have in there that ensure basically um, that our transactions are safe and correct and whatever we still read is correct and consistent and whatnot. And all of that, um, I mean, most applications require these, these things. Of course, there are web applications that can very well live with eventual consistency and all of these kinds of stuff. But most of the applications, I would argue that people make money with, that their business really relies on. They, need, they don't need eventual consistency, but they need all of, all of these uh, um, features, these capabilities, that have been developed and evolving over these 40 years. That there are. So, 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 what, so what do you say then to uh, the rise in the last five years or so of the microservice architecture that says your user is an object and it belongs to a single service and that user may have an address uh, or many addresses, that user may have uh, many email addresses, whatever the relationship is, but that's a separate service. That's, that's not a concern of the user. Uh, so therefore, hierarchy, transactions, relationships even, are meaningless in the microservice world if you follow the microservice architecture to a T and you go single object, single object per service, single table per service, uh, and you rely on eventual consistency, you rely on event sourcing, you rely on all these, uh, you know, CQRS, all these things to um, make your application work again the way we did it five years ago was with the transaction and, you know, you associated an email address with the user and if it failed, you could roll it back and you could provide that instant feedback to the user. So, so what do you say to the rise of the microservice architecture that goes counter to some of those things? And I don't mean to put you on, on the spot. I just, I'm interested. Yeah. I think yeah. from that, that service perspective, it's like that, but from the, from the data perspective, it's not because this service definitely wants to have good quality data. So if the data is stored in the way you just described, it will be crappy. It will be just splits of data <laughs> here and there, I and agree. not a whole picture of the customer or whatever you want to 
understand. So if, if you store the data in the same way, everything is going, it's going to be collapsing soon. So the data has, has to be treated differently. It has to be treated as a whole. And that's why we need what we call here RDBMS, which is actually a multi-model database. So we have one place to store all the data. The opposite would be a polyglot solution where we have different kinds of technologies to store different kinds of data, which is strange in a way because uh, when we store the data, we know that it is an object, it's, it's an XML, it's a JSON, whatever it is. But when we're actually using the data, how do we know how do we use it? Because your microservice is now using, let's say, JSON, but then you change it five years later to XYZ and you want to have it as XYZ. How do you do it? Because it's stored as JSON. That's why this multimodal database has conversions, like we have columnar stores. So the relational data or whatever data is converted to a different kind of storage structure, a model that is easier to use or more efficient to use or whatever for your service. So being able to make this kind of transformations for the data in memory, not on the disk, in memory is the gold here. That's why I think multimodal is great. First of all, the data is better, quali be is better quality because you have to think what you are storing. So you have the idea about identity of the data, how it's related to other data in the multimodal database and so on. And you have possibilities to have security, backups, recovery, consistency, all that kind of things that we take for granted, by the way. But if you have polyglot solution, you don't take it for granted anymore because there is no consistency between all those solutions. So <laughs> long answer, <laughs> No, but no, this no. is how I think. I, I, and I, I do tend to agree with you. Um, and I take a, a different kind of approach to um, the problems that are people are trying to solve with microservices. But uh, I think we're seeing in the, in the industry a shift towards um, common sense when it comes to things. Um, you know, I think people are realizing that they're not building Netflix with their startup. You know, they, they may be, they may eventually become Netflix or Facebook or Google. But um, I think, you know, even folks like Fowler and, and some of the other well-known um, advocates of this type of architecture, I think they're starting to say, well, do what makes sense and don't, uh, don't overbuild, don't over-engineer, don't build it until you need it type thing. So um, again, it's circular, you know, we've gone, we go full bore on a solution that is hot and popular at the moment. And then we kind of realize oh, we made some mistakes. Let's, let's and go back. It's again. not too different from SOA to begin with. Right, <laughs> right. Um, right. And it's like, but I mean, to be fair, like on the microservices architecture, I think what happened there is that we took something that sounds cool, new and fancy. And as always, like most of us, you know, developer types in IT, we're here to build new stuff, exciting new stuff, right? We're not here to maintain old stuff that's boring. Then we wouldn't go into this developer space, right? And, and like when you read through the original microservices papers from Fowler, like they, nobody ever said, you know, now take your monolithic application and for every class that you ever created in your, in your application, create now a microservice, right? Actually what it right. talked about is like you should separate business concerns, right? right? Basically what it was all about is like you're hindered to get out your new functionality or your time to market by another department, which is right. kind of, doesn't make sense to 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 be in any way kind of tied to them because you're doing very different things. Like the, the logistics department doesn't necessarily know about the payments department whether a customer just paid or not. And and to bring this towards cloud computing, I think um, you know this is this is an interesting trend that has happened, right? It's like why why and by the way those microservices papers go back to the early 2010s as well, right? They're kind of quite old now. They picked up rather later when in Fowler and actually uh, James Lewis uh, put his proposals together. And then, of course, we only ever read the first two paragraphs on Wikipedia and off we go. Now we do it. Right? We don't, we don't want to read the fine print either because, hey, now we want to do stuff. We don't want to understand everything. But, you know, so it, it's interesting, though, because when you go back in time, it's, it's basically just the same as SOA, just the reflection of what has happened, right? In the good old days, like when I started in, in the early 2000s, you know, we had a bunch of big, expensive servers. And we parked everything on them because we only could afford a bunch of big expensive servers, right? And so therefore, well, there wasn't a choice of like put everything on its own server or so forth. Right. Uh, 
uh, and you know you can only refresh them every so often. So of course you would have just one big database server, and we would you know put everything on there, and we would all have one or two big application servers, and we put everything on there. And and that is itself already led to what microservices tries to go again, uh, uh, kind of solve, right? It's like, well, if we needed to upgrade the server, 50 other people were telling us, well, we don't need to upgrade the server. Why would we not take your downtime or support, right? Or we right. need to upgrade version X. And, you know, that kind of like a, saw the, the, I don't actually remember when VMs came to happen, right? But this is kind of like we went from, from big beefy servers to VMs. Um, to some extent, and, and now we're in this cloud model where it's like, if I need a new server, it's like I click a button on, on the UI, and there's a server, and off you go, right? It's it basically instantaneous. Or you, or them. you use infrastructure as code, or you know, auto scaling, exactly, or yeah. you don't even have to think about servers getting turned up anymore. It's just and boom, it happens. Exactly, and I think there is this uh, hidden danger there that yeah. If you fragment your architecture, whether that's your data architecture, or your application architecture, unwillingly to one big, what they would call ball of mud, right? Uh, unintentionally, because you don't even have to think anymore about, you know, where they should be best served or how it's like, oh, I need a new server, I need a new database, just give me a new database and stop putting stuff in and off we go. And, and you know, this is kind of driven by the 24 seven always on, hey, we need to get the market before our competitors world as well. But it, it, it seems that it leaves, uh, you know, like a big trail to of mess to clean up later down the road. And, and I think this is, you know, uh, Heli Holger, you, you two have certainly seen some of those. So I would like to hand it over to you and see whether you agree or disagree. Well, I, I always tend to say if, uh, if, I, if I come to a customer and I see that their application development departments are going full microservice, full agile, I mean, now they are all there and doing it. And in the recent years in Switzerland, all of this was ramped up. I was basically telling the data warehouse people that I usually work with, like, you, you have jobs, your job is secured until your retirement. Because um, bringing all of these different uh, storage formats and, 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 and engines and stuff that they use and, and, and files and Kafka and whatnot together, to form again a whole that we can do reg reg uh, regulatory reports on and stuff. That's an awful lot of work. I mean, yes, microservice architectures and the way of doing things helps you be fast and uh, and agile on on the on the building side, which is good for business, of course. But uh, there's there's this whole other world of reporting and analysis on what happened and planning of the business and. Uh, doing reports for that uh, regulatory uh, bodies need and stuff. That work got considerably more complex, which is good for business, right? <laughs> but it's, it can, as you said, this ball of mud to, to well, make that nice again to one picture. That's, uh, that's really a challenge. Katie, how do you see that? Ellie, anything well. to add? <laughs> Nothing to add. <laughs> All right. I think that's about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, um, there's one more thing to, uh, well, one proof case, right, that I think lately about this, like microservice polyglot persistence, everybody stores their data in one one technology and, and actually more and more like, okay, just get a cloud database, who cares, right, just park the data. And it brings me back to also the early 2010s when big data was a thing, or especially HDFS and Hadoop was a big thing, right? And the whole claim to fame there was, it's like, hey, you know, it's schema on read, it's not schema on write. You can't just throw your data in as is and we figure it out later. <laughs> um, and, you know, like databases were there, data warehouses were there, schema on, on write was there. This is all this nonsense that holds us back. And, uh, and there again, like 10 years later, kind of, right? It's like, where are we now? Hadoop has not taken over the world, right? It's like, it, it's out there and it's used for certain things, or HDFS mostly, right? But I've actually seen a lot of people that were like, yeah, five terabytes of stuff is still five terabytes of stuff. And as this stuff gets bigger, it becomes much more exponentially complex to figure out what that stuff is than if only we would have actually paid a certain, you know, extra seconds to, to put apply schema on right and make sure that we figure out where we put that to begin, to begin with is not garbage. Uh, and this is just also something to think about, right? Because 
that's that's like not long time ago and yeah didn't take over and and you know now that we just okay rather than putting in one big pile and figure it all out we're gonna throw it in all different technologies and then we think we can figure it out it's like well if we couldn't already figure it out all in one big pile why do you think just fragmenting it as well makes it any better right or, right so well and that's the advantage of converged database right because we can take those different storage formats and we can store them all in one database and we can easily assemble them and use the familiar sql syntax for example that we're used to and we could do queries we could do filtering reporting all that stuff that we need to do um on that data instead and of trying to assemble it all in you know on the server side maybe with java or whatever server-side technology we're using and filter and sort and and, and yeah then a that new stuff. etl tool is born right we're gonna do etl <laughs> again or elt whatever but we never get a get over this transformation thing but right. uh, it's also an interesting thing that you said there that with the converged database right a lot of people also always think that that the relational database world claims put everything in one gigantic database well, I have never really seen that. I know for a fact that many of the Oracle customers have hundreds, uh, some even thousands of databases, right? Nobody tells you stick everything into right. one gigantic database. You can have many different instances of that. But the nice benefit of, of those what we now call multi-model or converged databases is, and, and by the way, the NoSQL databases are going towards multi-model too now, funnily enough, right? <laughs> they also have figured out that just doing one model is not necessarily give, giving you the flexibility everybody needs. Um, but the nice thing is what I always see on this is that, you know, even let's say you start with JSON because it is easy and so forth. If you put it in a, in a multimodal database or an even Oracle uh, a database, a converged database, if you ever want to change your mind later on, you actually can rather easily. You don't have to move terabytes of data around, especially in the cloud age. You don't have to necessarily move data, terabytes of data around that you either pay for moving and so forth. Um, you know, you can rather quickly actually transform this once, go from JSON to relational. You could even go from relational to JSON, same with graph and so forth. And so it gives you a little bit of more option of like what you can do. And you also don't have to toss out your frameworks and your drivers and everything and rewrite right. your apps either because the database underneath still stays the same as well. Right. And a lot of the <laughs> data abstraction layers that are existing in the world today speak all those different languages. You know, I mean, it's seamless to have JSON in a database because, you know, Juke or Micronaut Data or Spring Data or whatever you're using understands what it is and just handles it for you. So it's seamless to the to the to the developer for the most part. I think. Mm -hmm. All right, we're uh, we we're still on the first question. We're like. We've only got like 20 minutes left, so let's let's park that for now. And uh, of course, we could always pick that up uh, over beers at maybe in 2021 when we're allowed to be in public again. Um, so, next question: What is the biggest difference? And, and I, I suppose I, I was premature in putting the date in here, but I guess what's the pre biggest difference between application development between the time you started working with it, and, and I say 2005. But uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, and and development today, I think we t touched on a lot of this already. But is there anything in specific that jumps out in your mind that's different today than it was as far as database development, <laughs> Gerald? <laughs> From my point of view, maybe a little bit subjective. Back then, it was like think then code. Now it's code then think. Mm. And now it's copy paste. That time there was no place to copy. So it's also different. But I think those times people knew more about databases and how to store data and how, yes. to, how to handle it. Now it's a new skill, nobody has it. And the reason is that universities are not teaching it anymore or colleges are not teaching it anymore. So that is a big problem. Something that is different. Uh, the first application I built that I was even paid for was with Pascal. And I actually built a graphical user, user interface for that, which was something huge. <laughs> so nowadays, if somebody builds a graphical user interface, it's not huge. It's no. just what? <laughs> right. So things has changed a lot. So yeah. it's, it's harder to impress nowadays than it was in my times. Mm -hmm. Holger? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's just this, uh, this, uh, progression, this evolution basically. When I started, and I guess also when Heli started, it was basically you had to build everything yourself and you had awfully little compute and storage power. So 
everybody, especially when you were at university, uh, would, would learn about what, what effort is needed and how much resources do I need for uh, how to do th things and how, how does uh, the load develop? Is it a, a linear load? Will it, be, will it grow exponentially? Whatever. These kind of things, I think, are completely lost today. Uh, and, unless you and really run into the problem, this is a little bit like Gerald said, code, code, think. And, and for a good reason, because then at a certain time there were libraries around. So people had pre-coded stuff for you. So from knowing how to do it, the focus shifted to know which library to use and where to find it. And now it got more and more. And now today it's which uh, GUI framework do I use? Like as Heli said, you're using pre-built frameworks. You just have to decide which one is the right one for you. Or which web service provides already the answer to that stuff and I have to know how to call it. So it really changed very much um, to, to today. Plus, of course, also the, the development process changed. I mean, we, I mean, back then you would, you would say, okay, give me two months and I go back to my, to my office, which wasn't at home and it wasn't an right. open space, it was an office. Right. And then you would tinker and do and stuff and test and then you would come out and say, ta-da. Nowadays it's, well, uh, here's our daily stand-up. What did you do yesterday? I mean, this is really a very well, and, and, and not only that, but we're distributed teams now, right? I mean, yeah. back then we didn't yeah. have, you know, look, you're in Switzerland, Heli's in Finland, Gerald's in California, I'm in Georgia, and we're all talking. That didn't happen back then. I mean, you could have a conference bridge, but um, you bring up good points. You know, you think about early days of video game development, you know, and the Nintendo cartridges had what 64 K of storage on them, you know, so you had to be creative and, and, and what you did and how you compressed your assets, how you reused your assets. You had to think about every line of code that you wrote because the resources simply weren't there. Now you could get 128 cores and a bare metal machine like Gerald said in a click of a button. It's like it's out ridiculous. of memory, just add more memory. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, but that's, of course, creating just a problem with respect to the database. Because at least in my, in, in my daily uh, work, it's just that, as Hedy said, database is not, is, is not taught anymore in, right. uh, in the universities. And it's not sought after. I mean, universities don't have the courses because there's also not many people asking for them, right? And so you, we have a lot of developers that are very good at developing their applications, but they don't, don't have a clue. And then they go through a hibernate layer or whatever to the back end, and they don't have a clue, uh, and I don't blame them, how this thing in the back end works. And then suddenly they do something that doesn't scale at all. And, uh, and, and of course, Larry would like us to, 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 to license more and more calls. <laughs> We have bigger databases, but with an exponential growth of, of, of a resource consumption, even that wouldn't help, right? So this is a bit of a problem today. I think that the app developers are pretty far away from their, if they use a relational database management system from their storage layer. Well, that, that's funny that you say that because that leads directly into my next question. Uh, and that is historically, how much time did developers spend working with the database and let's say, you know, 95, 2000, 2005, during those time periods, has it gone down? And I think we all know the answer is yes. Uh, but I guess, why is that happening? And we've touched on that a little bit. But when I started in 2004, um, like day two of me learning to code in Cold Fusion was learning select star from users where username equals this. You know, that was like, fundamental foundation and I didn't follow the traditional learning path I didn't go to I didn't get a computer science degree I'm mostly self-taught but even back then it was that was day two of learning how to do dynamic web pages was learning how to write SQL um, I always joke and maybe it's not a joke but I always joke that um, you know the one of the first things you learn to do when you're becoming a, a web developer is learn how to write SQL and the second thing that you do is learn how to avoid writing SQL, right? So we get into Hibernate and we get into ORM and uh, these all these other libraries that help us avoid writing SQL. And for the most part, for standard CRUD, personally, I'm 100% okay with that. You just have to understand the limitations of the tool that you're using and not try to abuse them. You can't go all the way down an object graph that's deeply nested with relationships and expect it to be performant when you're having Hibernate write your query for you, right? 
So I guess, how do you feel about things like ORM? How do you feel about uh, GraphQL, some of these other technologies that uh, kind of hide and abstract away the SQL? Because personally, I feel I understood the basics and I understood what it was doing behind the scenes. So I respected it, but I think that's somewhat lost nowadays. Well, perhaps I'll take a start. <laughs> um, I, in regards to ORMs, I think it was a natural progression of so many things in, in, a, uh, in the software industry, right? It's like we, we always had this, um, this concept of abstraction, right? Nobody writes anymore their own kernel commands to write to a file or something. No, there's a library for you to do this, right? And then like there's just yet another abstraction on it. And I think that's good, that's just progress, right? Nobody has to know assembly anymore. We're not all writing assembly to make this thing actually do stuff, but you abstract it on top of it, even with programming languages. Um, so so that, that's just natural progression. I think where, where SQL is a little bit of a different beast is, and, and fully agree with you, like crowd operations, who cares? Right? Like instead of the delete, they're not very complex. It's like, you manipulate a given record or a given object in your application that translates to one or many records in the relational world. But for analytics, uh, SQL is to sort of make sense of the data, SQL is rather powerful. And uh, number one, to some extent, most people don't even ever get beyond ANSI SQL or ISO SQL 92, right? The very basic select from where group by, which is 1992, that's a long time. Uh, and SQL can do much more powerful things. And to, and to another extent, the ORM systems are not necessarily abstracting that either, right? ORM systems are more like uh, helping you to abstract those, those simple CRUD operations to simple SQL operations so that you don't have to build them. But that doesn't mean that sometimes I see folks that go like, well, SQL, you cannot do stuff, right? So it's very, it's very limited because they use such ORM systems and they are very limited to probably a good reason why. And then they would repeat the, the analysis in application code or so forth when all they really had to do was to understand SQL a little bit better. And I think actually, you know, ORM tools like Hibernate, they do kind of say that, you know, it's like don't use, uh, don't use Hibernate if you don't understand SQL, right? right. And uh, I think what they're really trying to tell you is like SQL is so versatile and so general purpose, yet another technology that has prevailed for 40 years, that the ORM systems cannot abstract all of this, right? And so... Should you still know some SQL? Yes, definitely. Should you never use an ORM system? No, I mean, it's an abstraction layer, just like you use a library to write to a file or do a REST call or whatever it is, right? But, but I think you have to understand where you stand and you have to understand, you know, as, as Holger said before, it's like, you know, what is it good, good for? What is it not good for? I think every developer today has to at least understand that. You don't have to be an expert in everything and with all the frameworks and libraries around there and that ever increasing, uh, uh, amount of technology coming on the market quicker and quicker. You cannot be an expert in everything, but you should at least take the time to understand what is it good for and what is it not good for. And you should take the time in five years down the road, looking back at it, it's like five years have passed. Is it now better or not? And this is another thing always, it's like, oh, we checked this out 10 years ago, it was bad, so it's still bad now, so let's move on with something else. Well, a lot of things happen in 10 years in the IT world. Right. Um, absolutely. Uh, we are we're running short on time, which is awesome. Uh, but I do have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna jump to the last one because I think it's probably the most interesting one at this point that we could squeeze in. And that is- Todd, may I, may I interject one thing to, to, please, the, to the last one? Please do. I definitely developers are working less with databases today than they used to, but they are not complaining less about databases. <laughs> That's uh, for sure. That that didn't change in my. Yeah, that's a very valid point. And uh, <laughs> I, you know, again, some of it, some of that complaining is even, um, you know, being relatively new to the Oracle world. Uh, you've all heard it, um, but I, I'm more recently to it. You know, a lot of it was directly related to the word Oracle, um, and, and I think that uh, a lot of that complaining. Um, well, of course, I feel like it's undeserved, um, but I think some of it is a directly attributable to the power of the Oracle database and how versatile it is and how much more it can do than some of the other ones that it may be a little more misunderstood or, um, you know, harder to pick up some of, not harder, but 
you know, there's more to learn when it comes to, okay, I need to do a linear regression. Well, that's easy to do in the Oracle database, um, but you just have to take the time to learn how to do it. Um, so I think some of that uh, disparity for the word Oracle comes from, from some of that complexity. What do, you, what do you guys think? Being external, I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your opinion on. Um, I, think, I, I think most of the complaining is, is, is for one, Oracle has been the market leader for a long time. And you've, always, you've all, all been complaining about Microsoft regarding operation systems and stuff yeah. for a long time. That's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that Oracle has a history of, uh, you know, some license uh, of aggressive sales and some licensing like the virtual the VMware stuff, which is not really customer friendly. So people are pissed there. But if we talk about the technology, I think this is especially really the problem This this the way Oracle makes it easy to be used. Right, using SQL, which abstracts lots of stuff away, doing all the magic in the background with the optimizer and stuff. It, it, it looks so easy that uh, and developers or many users, not only developers, they don't see how hard it is and what a beast it is, what the machinery is in the back end. So it's really, I'm, I'm telling you exactly what to do, the database. Why does it do, why, does, why is it not responding the way that I want? So it's, it's easy to complain, right? I think a lot that I see and is complained about is performance. And then I go and check the database because database <laughs> is always the guilty one. So I go and check the database and database is like 5%. So it's doing nothing. And the actual reason is somewhere in the middleware or somewhere because people don't know what database can do. So they are doing joins in middleware or in the, somewhere in the wrong place because database is the place to handle the data and just bring out the result and use right. that in your program. I so there are things like that. that. <laughs> Hell, you actually have a theory on that. My theory on that one is the reason why people blame the database because it's usually the one place, at least for Oracle database for sure, is where, where you have the diagnostic and the monitoring in place that you can't <laughs> figure out what's going on while in your application, you never even bothered or worried about how to diagnose, right? So people go like, well, it's the database because there we can at least figure out whether it is the database or not. <laughs> I had these conversations in the past where like, exactly as you say, the database isn't doing anything. Well, my application isn't doing anything either. And then, of course, we would jointly always joke about this. We would jointly blame the network because we didn't have a network admin anymore. So nobody could say, what the heck, guys? Right? We would just blame the network and the area. But most of the times, it's actually doing things inefficiently in the application. Yeah, and, and so the application is just waiting a lot of times because the way how it's talking to the network, to the database is inefficient or really any other uh, uh, over the network systems, right? Gosh, yeah. I have you. It's meta. I, this is leading to so many more questions. Tammy, can we have another two hours, please? <laughs> um, no, uh, I, 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 I have one, something I want to say about that, but let's jump to the last question instead. What will we be doing differently in 10 years? What, what, uh, what do you see us doing differently? Uh, and it, forgive my dog barking in the background. I apologize. Well, at least machine learning will be more powerful than it's today. So some of the coding will be done by machines not everything and not because the specs are always very uh, what's the right word weak or something because you have to use a lot of brain to understand what you actually wanted so what should you program so how do machines do that so they can't do any com those complex things but they could actually do all the basic things for us. So we don't have to do that. And what they could do, they could be assisting. So if, I, if I'm making a mistake with my program, machine learning could tell me, or artificial intelligence could tell me, Heli, fix this, this is gonna be wrong. So I think this is something that will change. Yeah, I, um, I, I recently saw a video on YouTube um, of some machine generated Python code, and it was scary how smart some of this machine generated code is and how accurate it is. I mean, I, you know, we're not going to be fully autonomous, you know, we're not going to have machines writing all of our code. We're still going to have to inspect it, but see, that scares me too, because we already talked about developers that are not as keen on SQL because they haven't exposed to it. So how are we going to be in 10 years when 90% of the code is generated for us and we have to make sure that it's 
it's performant, it's accurate, it's, it's doing the right things, and we have to troubleshoot bugs introduced by machine-generated code. That's scary to me. Um, I actually we think actually, that... we had Go that ahead. already. <laughs> <So> <laughs> when I started at the beginning of 90s, I was using, uh, uh, I think, well, Oracle tools that were generating SQL. Mm -hmm. And that SQL was not always good. Most of right. the times it was horrible. So my <laughs> job was to make sure that it, so, with some tricks, it will generate decent code. <laughs> so we already been there, but the difference is that it didn't have any artificial intelligence. It was just if and else program that was generating my code. So it that's, was not how, trick. that's not how machine learning works. It's not just a no. million switch, yeah. switch <laughs> statements. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I thought that's Never how it worked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Holger, um, anything so, uh, to add? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm more the I'm more the uh, well, I would say machine learning will do far less than we think, because everything that requires an understanding of what is done outside of a very small um, domain and a very well structured domain like programming, I can see what what, what Helly says in the do programming domain. I can see that, but yes, whatever Elon says, autonomous driving cars are very far out there. Uh, so and, and and robots and stuff that do meaningful things. So yes, we will see so, some stuff in, in in our domain, and I think that's good because we need so much more programming in the in, in the next twenty years. Uh, I mean, I think that can hardly be done by people. So it's good that we will get some some support there. But it's not it's not going to be magic. And uh, you your point, Todd, like who's how do we how do we prove that that uh, the the, the program is working uh, according to the specification and all these kinds of things. That's a comp and that's a research topic still. So, And uh, research is, is usually baby steps, not giant breakthroughs. So 2030, I think, won't be that much different. We will have, we will have a few more marketing and hype cycles of some <laughs> New, all new technology. And <laughs> what I think also wanted to say, that's the nice thing about this. We reinventing the wheel every few years in the IT industry and marketing, making this the big new thing. It's, there's always something is, something is kept. Like Hadoop HDFS, clearly a transitional technology from today's point of view, basically trying on premises what you would need the cloud for. We still have data lakes. The data lake is basically here and something like Spark. And, and parallel uh, computing with, with clusters on demand and these kinds of things. That's what we keep. All of the rest of the Hadoop era, I guess, is basically going away. You don't we, remember so new skills anymore. <laughs> and we haven't, even, we haven't even talked about quantum computing, so, um, <laughs> you, you know. We do in retirement. <laughs> yeah. So and I wish we had more time to hear about that. Yes, I know. Sorry, Tammy, uh, for going <laughs> long. But I really quickly, I want to thank you all. You all are brilliant. I appreciate you so much. It's been so fun. Thank you again, Tammy, and everyone for having us. And, and thanks again, Tammy.